Here's an idea. Developers have a responsibility to preserve history by making older release versions of their games available to be played. So the story goes that there's this guy called Theseus who had a boat that he'd sail around in with his buds. Now, naturally, there'd come a time when a board would begin to rot or the rudder would become loose, and of course, he'd promptly replace it. Over time, every part would be eventually swapped out until not a single piece of the original remained. The question then becomes, is this the same boat as before? And if the answer is no, when did it stop being the old boat? For the uninitiated, the ship of Theseus is an old philosophical question to which there is no objective answer. It's usually just fruitful to ask yourself what your opinion of it is and why, as a matter of introspection and understanding the perspective of others when it comes to qualities of originality. I mean, what even makes a game different from another? The first thing that comes to mind would be the feature set. Let's say you have a game and pressing the A button makes you jump, but then you change it so that the same player input would make you shoot. Those are completely different games, no question. But what if in the change version you still jump, but it just wasn't as high and you fall more slowly? These two characters would have to interact with their environment in different ways, if still similar. In fact, it could be made so drastic that it completely changes how you have to approach both completing challenges as a player and designing those challenges as, well, a designer. So where do we draw the line with games? And what does that mean for the responsibility of designers? On December 7th, 2010, the expansion to the popular, massively multiplayer online role-playing game World of Warcraft Cataclysm was released and dramatically changed the map of the game visually and mechanically. Volcanoes erupted, floodwaters rose, and earthquakes split the land in two. Quests were added, quests were removed, and some drop tables were changed resulting in some items going extinct for the time being. And it's unlikely at this point that the world's ever going to go back to how it was before this. In many regards, it's as if they made an entirely new game. You could put pre-cataclysm and post-cataclysm versions on a shelf at a store with separate titles, and people would probably accept that. But that's not how this works. When Madura's Mask was released, people could still play Ocarina of Time. Termina had not replaced Hyrule, and while I vastly prefer Termina overall, I would be sorely remiss to never go to Gerudo Valley or Kakariko Village ever again. Games where multiple people are playing on the same server require players to update and to not be able to revert changes for a variety of reasons, and what we end up with is, for all intents and purposes, a completely different game taking the place of an older one. You cannot legally play WoW in the world before Cataclysm. Many never even had the opportunity to do so and now potentially never will. But what if changes as big as Cataclysm brought aren't where the line is drawn? It could be said that any amount of changes to a game will alter the experience on a possibly fundamental level. Between Vanilla and Battle for Azeroth, there have been new zones, new races, new classes, new skills, new dungeons, new raids, and an ever-increasing level cap. And don't get me wrong. New content for our favorite games is always exciting, and even when experiments fail, taking a risk by changing things up is a net win for games. This isn't about halting progress, or even quality, it's about making sure that, as we keep moving forward, we preserve the history of this great medium. A metagame is, to say it shortly, the game within the game. The game of figuring out what's hot and what's not. What'll get you the wins and what's just throw in the match. Inevitably, these will form regardless of how well a game is balanced. People will figure out what strategies work and what don't, and eventually the designer will have to give it a nudge, if not to make the game more fun, then at least to stir the pot. Give people a new space to explore and encourage new styles of play to emerge from their systems. By definition, this nudge is intended to change how the game is played. What people were doing in Magic the Gathering before and after the Band of Deathrite Shaman in the Legacy format is like night and day. Strategies that used the graveyard got better by not having to fear the Shaman picking them apart. Players didn't have access to as much mana. Small creatures could attack more easily and low life totals weren't just dead man walking territory. Decks that would want to play the card became less popular and decks that folded to a turn 1 Deathrite weren't a joke anymore. That may sound like a lot of jargon, but suffice it to say that this rebalancing of the metagame made the landscape shift a lot. It changed how games were played and what was and wasn't popular in tournaments. 
it made prices fall, so you saw more people with the card in their trade binders, and definitely affected some people's experiences at legacy events. Again, the game may never be the same due to an ultimately small change. Now, Magic has the luxury of most often being played as an analog game. That is to say that it doesn't rely on code that is being followed by a machine to make the game happen. You can just say to your friend, Listen, bub, I want to play this old deck from before Deathrite Shaman was banned, and if they agree to do so, then you can do that. Not so easy for something like Hearthstone. A player joining today will never know what it was like to have a two-cost wild growth because you can't just tell the game to pretend that it costs less. To be clear, this change was good for the health of the game. This card is ridiculous on turn 2, honestly. But that doesn't mean that playing with this older version isn't a valuable experience. Maybe the player will better appreciate the current state of Wild Growth. Or maybe they're a designer themselves and can learn from the mistakes of others firsthand. Or maybe you just don't agree with the nerf at all and just want to play with a good old 2-mana gain another mana crystal. In a sense, every patch and update is burning a book. Now, it's almost always replaced with a new book that is very similar, and many times just strictly better for the end user to make use of, but that's not really the point. A new player joining Magic Arena will never know what it was like to play with Amon Ket cards in Standard. Normal new Overwatch players know what it was like to play when Genji's double jump were set after wall climbing, or Symmetra pre-rework. Or pre-rework. And that's just the intentional stuff. <laughs> Right, let's talk Death of the Author. I bought The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild on its release date, and got to playing it with zero outside information. Eventually, I stumbled upon a labyrinth in the desert. For most people, this is the challenge of navigating winding corridors, finding paths not visible on the overhead map, and reaching the shrine visible beneath the grate at the start of the whole thing. This is not what I experienced. When I arrived at the South Lome Labyrinth, the grate had not loaded in, and I simply dropped down and claimed the shrine as my own. I was incredibly disappointed, and not just because I was cheated out of a fun challenge, but because as far as I knew, there wasn't a fun challenge to be found there. Unfortunately for me, only the special edition of Breath of the Wild comes with Reggie to tell me exactly how to play the game that he made with his big strong hands, meaning that even if my experience of the game wasn't the intended way it was to be experienced, it is still a valid one. It still formed a part of my impression on the work as a whole, however minor. And if my experience of a work of art can be influenced by misreadings of intent or encountering an error in the code as in this case, then how much of what the author meant for me to interpret of the work even matters? In many ways, bugs are just features that weren't planned. At the end of the day, they're in the game and they will affect attitudes towards it. Sometimes negatively, like my experience with the Labyrinth and Breath of the Wild, but also many times positively. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't love Skyrim as much if this could or this, or these. For another example of how much a bug remaining in the game can define it, look no further than Bloodborne. Speedruns of this game used to take under 20 minutes of in-game time because you used to be able to get onto some geometry that you weren't supposed to, and then jump off these bags right around here, and hey look, you skipped a huge portion of the early game. But then the game was patched, and this was removed. This seemingly innocuous change is so drastic that patches before and after this change are in separate categories of speedruns altogether. As I mentioned before, it's almost like a completely different game in this regard. If bugs are things that weren't intended to be in the game, but the author's intentions don't matter, then bugs are features like any other, and patching them is just as much book burning as content packs, rebalances, and quality of life improvements. Now of course, patches should happen. Most of the time when they go through, they're an attempt to make the game even better than it was before, and that's great! But just like book burning, it is history erasure, and if that's the case, then maybe developers have an obligation to society to allow free access to previous versions. Now there already exist some games that you can revert the versions on, you just have to jump through a lot of hoops most of the time. For PS4 games, first you have to uninstall the game from your console, and then reinstall it from disc, meaning that digital copy owners can't even do this to begin with. And then you gotta make sure that while you're doing all that, that you're not connected to the internet so that you don't get the patch. It's just clear that From Software didn't intend for players to go backwards on versions because of this, and they might be in the wrong for this. Society deserves to be able to see the other states that the game was in after it was released, even if that means making the game worse in a lot of ways. It's important to our culture, both gaming and just, you know, culture, that we can see how development of these things came along after release, to experience games in their infancy and to learn from the mistakes of devs big and small. 
Some individuals may even prefer the games in those previous states. For example, since board games and card games aren't bound by the laws of code, players of Yu-Gi-Oh! can pretend it's 2005 and play with cards only legal then, and many of them do, claiming it as the high point in the game's history. It would be a shame if the history of so many great games were lost to the annals of time. The biggest concern is the practicality of it all. Is it too much to ask developers to make sure that every patch of a game, with all their patch notes, are on the cloud all at the same time and available in the menus of every game? Well, it's already proven that this is feasible. Minecraft made the choice to allow players to pick from whatever version they wanted to play right from the client itself for the sake of mod compatibility. Street Fighter 4 went above and beyond, allowing players to mix and match characters as they were from different patches just for the heck of it. Want to play 1.1 Ryu versus 1.2 Gal? You can do that. Or maybe just change everything back to vanilla. That's supported. But can we expect that from every studio? I don't even know if it's more or less viable for smaller projects. What about patches that fixed only things like credit card security or something that broke the in-game economy and was costing the company revenue? Things that would be an absolute liability to keep leaving around, are those worth preserving for the sake of history? And what about online games? Can companies really afford to have players playing on separate patches when other players are basically the content of the game? And on that note, what about MMOs? Can it really be said to be a real emulation of what it was like back in the day if you only have a couple hundred people playing on your patch? Not to mention what we would do about pre-digital age media. There's a lot of questions that we don't have the answers to here. And I doubt many in the industry have many of them as well, given the lack of service on this front. But I think it is critical for us to find a solution to this, because for as long as we don't, a big part of the history of this beautiful medium will be left behind. What do you all think? Where's the line for supporting backwards compatibility? Is there a line? Or maybe you feel like these patches and updates aren't erasure at all and nothing needs to be done about it. How do you feel about fan communities taking matters into their own hands being shut down? Do you think it's unfair of them to be doing this without the developer's permission? Or do you think it's unfair of the developer to be denying access to something that they won't or simply can't provide? I'm interested in seeing your takes on this issue in the comment section below. Thanks for watching all. Like I said, I want to know what you think, so leave a comment, give me a like, hit subscribe, smash that bell, follow me on Twitter, and caress my heart like these fine people in my credits did. They got there by pledging to me on Patreon. The link is in the description. Right now, patrons get to see my workflow, such as scripts and bloopers, join the credits, vote in polls, determining what upcoming projects will be on, and top tier pledgers get special recognition like this. Thanks so much to Andrew Loomer, Leela the Final, Nikolai Carpathia, 3 Eyed P, and Brad Goodrich, my own father. What a wonderful collection of folks. For the next video, we're going back home to finish my trilogy on 3D Mario games with Super Mario Galaxy. Cheers!